Hi, good evening, everyone. I'll ask you to take your seats. I know everyone's having such a great time downstairs talking to one another. Hello to everyone online as well. Thank you for being patient with us as we socialize in person. My name is Matthew McClendon. I'm the J. Sanford Miller Family Director here at the Fralin Museum of Art. And I am so thrilled to see you all in person. And I know we have a lot of people joining us online tonight. So welcome to the Fashion is Art 2022 kickoff event. Launched in 2019, Fashion is Art is an annual event series engaging the community with art, fashion, and the Fralin. In partnership with local businesses and the museum's volunteer board, the events not only create awareness for the museum, its mission and programming, but also the breadth and depth of artists and artisans from our area and beyond. Fashion is Art 2022 would not be possible without our sponsors, Annie Gould Gallery, Gaspari, Jillian Valentine, The Lori Holiday Shop, Posh, Scarpa, and Tom and Rebecca Lecouye. The partnership of local businesses. Visit Arsenic and Old Lace, Gaspari, and Scarpa in Charlottesville and their events on September 23rd. And Annie Gould Gallery, Jillian Valentine, The Lori Holiday Shop, and Posh and their events in Gordonsville on September 24th. We are thankful for the efforts of our dedicated volunteer board members, especially Jane Grigg for the wonderful designs for the event and events committee co-chair Rebecca Lecouye for her leadership and vision. From, yes, clap for Rebecca. And Jane. For more information on the events, please visit the Freyland's website and click on Fashion as Art in the calendar section. And we are, of course, most grateful to our speaker, Caroline Alinowitz Hess. Caroline is a fashion historian based in New York City and hosts webinars on fashion history with the New York Adventure Club. Currently a PhD student at the Bard Graduate Center, her research is focused on definitions of femininity in the 20th century in France and the United States. She spent several years working as a fashion designer before pursuing her MA in fashion studies from Parsons. She previously received her BA in English literature from Yale and an AAS in fashion design from FIT. Her writing has been published in Fashion Theory, the Journal of Design History, Atlas Obscura, Jezebel, and the Bloomsbury Fashion Video Archive. She curated an online exhibition for the Underpinnings Museum and has been quoted in articles in Harper's Bazaar, Elle, ID, and W Magazine. Before I turn things over to Caroline for her talk, Catwalk as Canvas, the Interwoven Worlds of Fashion and Art, there are a few logistical reminders. Following the talk, we will have time for questions. If you have a question, please enter it in the Q&A in the Zoom navigation bar. Or if you're in person, you can just raise your hand. I know you're wondering. My colleagues will monitor the questions and lift them up to Caroline. Caroline's talk is being recorded and will be posted on the Freyland's YouTube channel soon. Thank you for joining us today, and I hope to see you all at Fashion as Art events and in the Freyland's galleries. Now, please help me welcome Caroline Alinowitz Hess. Hello, everyone. I am so excited to be here with you tonight. So excited to see some of you in person and, of course, all of you online as well. I am so excited to be talking about this topic because it's one that I personally find really exciting. And I think that the way in which fashion and art intersect is something that is talked about a lot, but we don't really break down the different categories and different ways that it happens. Well, the first question that I, that I wanna ask is, is fashion art? But the truth is that I don't want to answer that question because I think that that is a question that doesn't really get at the issues here. I think it's a question that's enormous and exciting and has a lot to do with the philosophy of both fashion and art. But what I really want to talk to you today about is how those two worlds connect. And I'm going to accept for now as a premise that fine art and fashion are different, that they do have differences. And I want to think about when do those differences connect and when are they just impossible to put together? So 
what I want to ask is, how do fashion and art intersect? The first thing that I want to talk about is when fashion is in art. And I specifically want to talk about the late 19th century, a time in which a lot of writers and artists, especially in France, were really excited about the idea of painting modern life. And so much of that and so much of the idea of what modernity was, was connected to fashion because what else would be a better thing to use to show what is new, what is fresh, what is happening? So I have this quote here from Charles Baudelaire, who was a poet and cultural critic of the time period. And he says, the artist is looking for that indefinable something we may be allowed to call modernity, for want of a better term to express the idea in question. The aim for him is to extract, extract from fashion the poetry that resides in its historical envelope, to distill the eternal from the transitory. Modernity is the transient, the fleeting, the contingent. It is one half of art, the other being the eternal and the immovable. There was a form of modernity for every painter of the past. The majority of the fine portraits that remain to us from former times are clothed in the dress of their own day. They are perfectly harmonious works because the dress, the hairstyle, and even the gesture, the expression and the smile, each age has its own carriage, its expression and its smile, form a whole full of vitality. And this essay that he wrote this in was actually about one artist in particular, and that was Constantine Guy. And this a House of Ill Repute is actually in the Freeland collection here. Thematically, it is a little bit more racy than I was going for, but it is very appropriate to late 19th century Paris. And what Baudelaire was saying was that Constantine Guy was Constantin Guy was such an exciting artist because he was capturing something that you couldn't you couldn't capture if you were an artist who worked in a studio who worked slowly who took a lot of time that he was capturing something ineffable about modernity that it was something that happened really really fast and the ability to catch fashion in the moment was incredibly valuable. Now, this is an artist that many of you may be more familiar with. This is Monet, and he is someone who is really well known for his portrayals of water lilies, of flowers, but he was also extremely interested in portraying women, and particularly women in the open air, women who were wearing contemporary fashion. And we do have examples that remain today that show how exactly he was capturing the fashion of the moment. He was someone who was really interested, just as he was interested in capturing the light on a cathedral or the snow on top of a you know farm field, he wanted to capture women as they were, as he saw them. Not that it wasn't very artful, not that it wasn't very careful, but he was really trying to observe and put down what he saw. And a lot of that had to do with the fashion of the time. Another artist who was very interested in capturing his time was Gustave Caillebotte. And he was really using Paris as a place that he wanted to work, that he wanted to portray. And in this work, one of his most famous He's showing Paris on a rainy day. And what you can read from this image is the way that all the men of this period look identical to one another. They're all wearing exactly the same thing. There is this woman in the foreground though, who's dressed a little bit differently, who you can tell is a woman, but it's also a time period in which there are these new avenues who are, that are going down in Paris because um, Baron Haussmann has been commissioned to widen up the streets for a lot of different reasons we can't get into now. But the result of that is that they are really these places that you can promenade and so that women of fashion are being seen much more on the streets. And this is an example of a walking dress that's in the Metz Club Collection, it's very much of the same period, even though this is probably one that would be worn by a slightly higher class woman than the one that's in this photo, I mean, in this painting, rather. Some other artists who were interested in fashion, but in very different ways, were Renoir and Tissot. Renoir was similar to Monet, really interested in capturing the ordinary woman of the moment. So that's what we have here. He called this painting La Parisienne because she's supposed to be the epitome of the Parisian woman. She's someone who is dressed neatly. She's a bourgeois woman. She's not of the upper classes, but she looks very chic. And that's what he's trying to capture here. On the other side, we have Tissot. Tissot was, his whole family was in 
um, the garment trade. So he was someone who was very interested in fashion. And today, when we look at this painting, we think, wow, that must have been the height of fashion at that time. You must have been recording what was in the uh, fashion journals and the fashion magazines. No, this was his own creation. And in fact, there was commentary of the period that said, this is not what's fashionable, this is entirely out of fashion. So I think that it's interesting to see <laughs> how these artists, some are really focused on almost documentary representation of what they're seeing. And some think, well, I think I could be a fashion designer. And so that's what I'm gonna do here. An artist who I think we can put a little bit in the middle there is Sargent, who of course is an American, but he did work a lot in Paris as well, especially in the beginning of his career. And he was someone who you can see had a really masterful hand at portraying fabrics, of portraying the clothes that his sitters wore, but he was also someone in, the, in this portraiture who took a lot of leeway himself about what they should wear. He was not someone who was trying to say, oh, you come in with what you wear best, I'll portray you. He was really trying to portray what he wanted, obviously in the pay of the sitter. And these are both portraits that were made for their sitters. But I think that these are examples of different ways that artists get involved in the fashion process, that it's not just fashion and art away from one another. They're really in conversation and that artists, when they're portraying people, think a lot about what they're wearing. And especially in the late 19th century, we're really interested in how do I portray women today? Men too, but he's in the background here. The next thing that I wanna talk about is when fashion designers take art and put it in their work, because this is a kind of a different category. This is a time in which People are trying to say, okay, this is an artist, this is a fine artist, this is a painting. How do I bring that into fashion? And I think that a lot of that has to do with the way that fashion is seen as lesser and the way that fine art, especially we'll see in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, is given this really exalted place in culture. So an artist who, I mean, a fashion designer who I think is really important to know about and to think about when we start thinking about what is a fashion designer in the 19th century and how, does the, how do we understand who they are and how they operate is Charles Frederick Worth. He was not the first fashion designer to have his own collections that people came to see. He was not the first fashion designer to have a label under his own name but he was the one who made it famous. And so if you were a late 19th century woman with plenty of disposable income, what you wanted more than anything was a Worth gown because that was the height of fashion. And he was the name that was basically synonymous with fashion. The, thing, the reason I bring him up when you talk about art is because he really tried to model the role of the fashion designer as a kind of artist. You don't see it here exactly, but he tried to portray himself as an artist. He also had these tags that he would put in his clothing that had his signature on it. And that was something that he was really trying to connect to the idea of the artist's signature. And so one other thing that helped him out a lot and why I included her here is this is Empress Eugenie and she was one of his great patrons. So I think that that as well was a part of his portraying himself as an artist that he would have this patron artist relationship as well. So all of these things added together were some might say a marketing technique, but I think that they were a way in which the fashion designer was trying to elevate his craft and trying to become an individual who was memorable in his own right. Now this is a cloak actually that's from a little bit later, but I think that this is also interesting to look at as a strategy, how Worth used art to make his fashion look beautiful and to make it more desirable. Here we can see that this is a textile which is based on Dutch old master still lifes. That was very clearly the inspiration here. Even the use of tulips is very connected to that. But I think the one thing that's really important to know about Worth is that he was someone who worked really closely with fabric manufacturers. So a lot of these works that he did were completely custom for him. So you couldn't get them anywhere else. And in that way, he was showing this is original. 
Of course, it wasn't original in the same way that we would think of art as original, but I think in the same way we think of a print or even a photograph, he was having something that he created that he had a few versions of and a few replicas, but it still had this special mystique of an artwork. This is another Worth gown that was actually made by his son, but I think that it adds another layer to the way in which he's trying to turn his um, whole company and his family's company into a kind of art house. And that was, he was trying to incorporate the city of Paris into his work. And so his use of the wrought iron railing design here, it's not necessarily clear where exactly he got that wrought iron railing from, but clearly this is something that's a signature of Paris, something you can see everywhere. And he's also associated a lot with these Ancien Regime Hôtel Particulier, which were the ones where you would go up these sweeping stairs. And you can just imagine her sweeping up those stairs, looking just like those wrought iron railings and it's a story that you're telling through this as well. This is also a fabric that was woven specially for him. And in fact, the railings are not parallel on the skirt. They slowly get smaller and smaller as you go up towards the waist, which was woven custom for this shape, which means it made the waist look even smaller because it was all close together and that it could get bigger and bigger down at the bottom. So all of that was really carefully crafted and could only be made for the client who came to wear it. There are several versions of this dress. This isn't the only one, but it was still something that was very, very hard to get a hold of and would certainly make you stand out. I'm showing you Botticelli's Primavera, another very famous painting, because we're now going to move from France to Italy. And Italian fashion designers of the early 20th century had a problem. No one knew that there were any Italian fashion designers in the early 20th century. In fact, they thought that France was the only place that there was fashion. That wasn't entirely untrue, because a lot of the Italian designers of that period replicated French designs, and even pretended that they were French themselves. However, <laughs> Italy did have one thing that France didn't, and that was the Renaissance. So what they did is several Italian fashion designers specifically drew on the Renaissance. And when I say the Renaissance, I only mean this painting, but <laughs> they specifically drew on the Renaissance as the time period that they could use to establish actually here in Italy, we do have a culture, we do have a style, we have something that's different than everyone else. And so the first person I want to highlight for that is this woman, Rosa Gennoni. She's really little known now because she was never a successful commercial fashion designer, but she was someone who was really, really interested in supporting Italian culture and of supporting the idea that there could be Italian fashion designers, that there was actually creativity in fashion in Italy. Shocking, I know. But what you can see here is this was something she really tried to do by connecting it to the Renaissance. This was not the only dress she did. She did a series of them. Each one was connected to a different Renaissance artist. But I think what you can see here is how closely she tried to wed it to the original, but also using the silhouette that was fashionable at the turn of the century. And this was a gown that was displayed as part of an international exposition at, in that time period, also to show not only everyone in Italy, but everyone internationally, that this was something that they should be paying attention to, that Italy was the next place for fashion. Another designer who used the Primavera as an inspiration was Elsa Schiaparelli. She was of Italian origins, but she actually worked in Paris. So I think there's some war. Is she French? Is she Italian? I'm going to stick with Italian for now. And this is a collection she did in fall of 1938, which she called her Pagan Collection. And she really drew on the Primavera as an inspiration. This is a couple objects from the collection you can see here. One is this dress and the other is a jacket. And it actually has a little necklace inside, if you can see it there. The thing that I think is so interesting about Scaparelli's take on it is she does something that's not in the original. She adds insects to this necklace and to this jacket. And I think that that adds a very interesting element of decay, an element of perhaps a little bit of ick, especially if some of you are not that fond of insects. So in some ways, she's taking this thing which we associate with the Renaissance, we associate with Italy, 
and pushing it a little bit further. And we're going to talk a little bit later about her collaborations with surrealists. I think we can see a little bit in there as well that she's really interested in doing things that are kind of spooky, that are a little bit darker, that make you think, hmm, that's not what I expected from fashion. Now, Yves Saint Laurent is probably who you first thought of if you were thinking of fashion art, because his fall, winter 1965-66 collection, his Mondrian collection, is one of the most famous that he did and the one that was copied again and again and again. But I think that it's a really interesting example to think about art and fashion because there's a few things about it that are not that obvious from the surface. Although the thing that's most obvious and the reason it got copied and copied is when you first look at it, you think, oh, that's Mondrian. You can immediately recognize it. Mondrian was an artist who was working in the 20s and 30s. He was already by the 60s a well-regarded blue chip artist that was selling well. He was someone who was collected in museums. So it wasn't a really daring bet to choose uh, Mondrian at this time. However, I think that there's something about the Mondrian dress that actually has a lot of similarities to Mondrian's work that you would only appreciate if you looked really closely and if you understood how couture works. And that is that Mondrian's work looks simple, but actually, if you look at it in person, those layers of paint are not as plain as you think. And the work itself is a lot more complicated and has a lot of things in it that you really have to be up close to appreciate. The couture dress has some of that as well. And the thing about it that's hard to understand is that when you look at it, you think, this is so obvious. This is square. This is a rectangle. But you're making this on a curve. This is not something that is easy to do. And it's not something that is easy to make look perfect. And that's something that he could do because he really, his uh, petit main, the people who made it, really understood the wool that they were working with. It doesn't have any darts. It doesn't have, it, the only seams it has are the ones that are part of the pattern. That means you can't adjust it on the side. You can't do the things that you'd usually do to kind of make it fit if it didn't work. What you have to do is steam the pieces of the fabric to make sure they fit together almost like a sculpture. So that these are things that in that garment and all of those subtleties really do have a lot of connection. I think more deeply than simply, oh, they look similar than to the work of Mondrian. And here is Yves Saint Laurent's original sketches from that collection. And I like to show it because you can see how many different variations on this theme that he worked with, that it was really something that he found very creatively exciting and that he worked with a lot. It was also something that a lot of other people saw money signs when they when they looked at because there were so many copies that were made. And I think that it's really interesting to see if you look at a comparison between the original and the copy, how carefully the original is done and how much the copy would need to do to really get to that level. And here you can see the original. Again, I love this one photo of Muriel here because the lines are so exactly straight. You can see that even when it's on a body, it looks like it's a painting. And that's a much harder illusion than you think when you look at it. This is actually a video of the models from that show walking in front of actual Mondrian paintings. And one thing that I think is interesting about the worlds of fashion and art is that, at least in my experience, art often places itself above fashion. It often says, we are not touched by those petty concerns of money. We are about the eternal and the divine or something like that. Anyway, we don't deal with the dirty things like commerce. However, the first Mondrian retrospective that was ever put on in Paris was after this show that Yves Saint Laurent did. So it's clear that this collection from Yves Saint Laurent, even though Mondrian was already a well-known artist, was one that provoked more interest in Mondrian's work, even from museums and even from curators. So there's really this interplay that's not just one way. They play off each other.
Yves Saint Laurent also did not give up the idea of including art in his fashion. This is from his 1988 spring summer collection. And you can see that he did jackets that look like two different paintings by Vincent van Gogh. The one is the sunflowers and the other is irises. I'm not 100% sure if this is related, but I have to tell you that a few years before this, there had been an exhibition at the Metropolitan Museum of Yves Saint Laurent's work. It was widely panned and criticized for being a betrayal of the Met's values, that they were showing commercial fashion from a living designer. And I do have to wonder, especially because they have that Iris's painting in the Met collection, is this Yves Saint Laurent saying, well, I don't care, my, my fashion is art? I can't say, but I definitely think that the fact that even after he was getting all of that criticism and the museum was getting a lot of criticism, they actually did not do an exhibition of a living designer for, I think, three decades after they did that one because there was so much backlash. The other thing that I want to talk about are creative partnerships, because this is something that is really rewarding to look at in fashion and art, that there it's not just one way and that the two can communicate with one another. And if they are really good communicators, something kind of magical can happen. The first partnership I wanna talk about is Elsa Scaparelli, who we saw before, and Salvador Dali. The two of them collaborated on a lot of different things. I can't show them all today, but they really were close collaborators because they both appreciated the work of the other. And one thing that I have to say for the Surrealists is that they really did think fashion was interesting and they really did want to engage with fashion because it had all of these elements of creepiness, that there's something about mannequins that is just weird and Surrealists loved mannequins. Here is an example of Salvador Dali's telephone with a lobster, which was, he used lobsters many times and telephones thematically in his work as a kind of dream vision. They were also connected with sexuality for him. And then this is a dress by Elsa Scaparelli where she has a giant lobster across the skirt. One thing you might not notice is that it actually has parsley on the skirt as well. So the, the, <laughs> it's kind of like a joke. The whole thing, although it has this giant lobster that's a bit odd, it also is almost like you spilled your dinner on yourself. And I think that that kind of joke is really what Scaparelli and Dolly enjoyed together. This is another Scaparelli dress and veil that is very much connected to Dolly and takes it in a very different, much darker direction. The dress, if you can see it, is a dress that has screen printing on it. And what it looks like is rips in the dress. The veil as well has these little pieces that are ripped almost on it, although they're all perfectly finished. There's actually zero ripping that has actually taken place here. It was very carefully sewn. But what you see here is a dress that was inspired by this painting, three young surrealist women holding in their arms the skins of an orchestra. I think the skins of an orchestra is very disturbing as an idea. And I think that that's what Elsa Scaparelli was drawing upon as well. It's hard to, I think that when we try to attribute, talk about fashion, we often talk about a kind of subconscious understanding of the political situation. And Elsa Scaparelli was someone who seemed to absorb a lot of the anxiety of late 1930s Europe. And she was really showing that in her work. And I think that the way in which this dress looks like the skin has been ripped from the wearer is not your typical fashionable look. She also did dresses at the time that had gun um, bullets as the buttons. And she did one that looked like a skeleton. She was definitely someone who was not afraid to go in a more macabre direction. Another surrealist that she partnered with was Merritt Oppenheim. She is best known for this object in the corner here, which is at, in the collection at MoMA. And it is a teacup, a spoon, and a saucer that are all covered in fur. I think that that, I personally think that's absolutely brilliant because I think that when you see it, you picture the sensation of trying to drink tea from a cup covered in fur, which is both interesting and kind of disgusting, I think. 
But she was someone who Scaparelli also appreciated and she commissioned her to make these bracelets with fur on them. They were also going to collaborate on these shoes. I don't think they ever came to fruition. They also had some gloves with nails that they worked on. But she was really trying to think outside the box and think about what can I do that no one else is doing? And I have to give it to Scaparelli. She succeeded on many counts. Scaparelli did not stop there. She also partnered with Jean Cocteau and she really liked his style of these drawings that are very loose. He was also very interested in surrealism. And you can see here that this jacket has a woman's head on the shoulder. And then as you go down the arm, there's this golden hair flowing all the way down the arm. This is another coat that she did in collaboration with Jean Cocteau, and it has an illusion on it where it has these two kissing faces, but it's also got the vase with the flowers. So this kind of illusion was one sort of like the joke with the um, lobster that was really interesting. And this idea of the kind of optical trick that a lot of the surrealists were interested in and that Scaparelli tried to use in her work as well. One of my favorite collaborations is between Yves Saint Laurent and Leila Lalanne. They were a couple who were sculptors who did these really fantastical sculptures that were sometimes jewelry, sometimes home furnishings. And this is a collaboration they did for his Haute Couture collection in 1969. And what they did is that they made these like breastplate pieces that were molded from the bodies of the models and then worn on the runway over these dresses. And you can see here the way in which it was made. We have fantastically documentary footage of the molding process. And then you can see the sketch and then how it looked in the runway presentation. What I think is so exciting about this project is that I think the idea of human sculpture is really where fashion and art have a lot in common and they ask a lot of the same questions. I think when you think about a model on the runway, are they wearing the clothes as a kind of performance art? Are they a sculpture in themselves? How do we know? And I think that this type of work really blurs that line. And it's something that is really thought provoking. The other thing that it makes me think of is the myth of Pygmalion and Galatea. The myth of Pygmalion and Galatea is from Ovid's Metamorphoses. He tells, he was a Roman poet and he tells the story of a sculptor and he sculpted this, sculpted the sculpture. He made this sculpture that was so beautiful that he fell in love with it. And this painting by Jerome is showing the moment that the sculpture comes to life because he begs the goddess Venus to please make her alive so that he can marry her because he loves her so much. Now, I think that that has a lot of problematic connotations. He made her and now he loves her and now she's a person and she has to love him because he made her. I think that was one of the things that certainly George Bernard Shaw was trying to think of in his play Pygmalion, which was turned into the movie My, My Fair Lady. So many of you might be familiar with that. But I think that this idea of what is the relationship between the artist and the object but when it comes to fashion, what is the relationship between the fashion designer and what they're making? How do we draw the line? When do this, does the fashion designer get to decide what they wanna do? And when does the wearer make it their own? And in art, if you're actually making a sculpture who never moves, they don't talk back. But I think in fashion, there's much more of this negotiation how far can you push what you want as a fashion designer? And when do you have to realize that the person that you're talking about is a person? They're going to speak up, they have needs, they have comfort that they have to deal with and that clothing is something that we go through our everyday life wearing. How does that fit into your dream? And that's something that I think is interesting when it goes weird. I think with Scaparelli, she's trying to push the boundary of how weird can we be? but there are limits, especially when you're working with people. And I think that's something that these designers are really testing. Naturally, because that's such an interesting idea, they were not the only designers to try that out. And this is a bodice from 1980 by Issey Miyake, where he's taking it and thinking, hmm, 
this kind of feels like it's about superheroes. How do I get superheroes in here? And I think the question of how much is clothing a kind of armor? How much are we superheroes based on what we put on? And I think that it's pretty astonishing when a garment can ask all of those questions almost by itself. Although of course it's better when it's worn by Grace Jones. This is also a question that Alexander McQueen was interested in, and it becomes a very different question when you think not about whether you're a superhero, but whether you have the abilities that everyone else has. And this is a collaboration with Amy Mullins, who was a model who was, who was missing the bottom half of both of her legs. So he made these, not him personally, he commissioned these carved lower leg prosthetics that are very, very beautiful, they're not that easy to wear, but they're a really interesting line between, is this necessary? Is this art? Is this fashion? What is this object? Is it part of her body? When, where does that stop? And I think that that's something that you can also see with the kind of bodice he has. It looks almost like armor. It looks almost like a sculpture, but it also has those stitches in it, almost like she has been wounded and she's been sewn back together. So how do we, define the human body and how much does fashion get to play a part in how we do that. The final section that I'm going to talk about are designers and artists who are the same or are trying to cross the line and trying to do both. The first one I'm going to talk about is Henry van de Velde. He was a late 19th century artist, well, uh, he did everything, Renaissance man, but um, architect in particular, he did a lot of furniture design. He really felt that he could design the entire world. The entire world in this case included his wife's clothing and he hoped the clothing of everyone he knew. It didn't really succeed in that it wasn't really necessarily picked up by the broader public, but he really did have a following. He was based in Germany at the time when he was doing this that tried his reform clothing and were thinking, is this the new way to be fashionable and to be beautiful and to be feminine? And one thing you might notice is what's particularly common in other places at this time that we saw earlier with Tissot, for example, is the really narrow waist from the corset. This was something that he wasn't really interested in and he thought it was better to have a kind of medieval silhouette that draped to the floor. Another group who were thinking somewhat along the same lines a little bit later were the Omega workshops, which were started by Roger Fry and the Bloomsbury group. This was based in the UK and they were trying to make this workshop that again, did a little bit of everything. They did fabric design, they did furniture design, they did interior decoration, they wrote poetry, everything. But here you can see um, two members of the group, Nina Hamnet and Winifred Gill, who are wearing outfits that are meant to be living art. And these art, these fabric designs also turned up in art. This is a painting by Roger Fry, which includes one of the fabric designs that you can see here. This also did not only happen in Germany, in England, but also in Russia. These were two artists, Varvara Stepanova and Lubov Popova, who both were artists who did um, paintings, as you can see here, but they were also interested in clothing. Here you can see designs by Stepanova. And what I think is really interesting is her quote here, I wanted to produce an actual object, a total material environment in which the living human material was to act. And I think that that's something that we can really see from the last two people we looked at as well, that there's this idea towards the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century that what if we could just design the entire world, wouldn't it be better? And that included clothing. And I just think that the colors and the stripes are incredible. And these are what Popova did. She was more known for her fabric designs, which you can see here with the triangles, but she also designed coats and she did this door window display. One thing that I think is also interesting is that a lot of times when we think of Russian design um, after the revolution, we think of the later designs of the Soviet Union that are maybe seen as a little bit more drab. This is not drab. And this is really where they were trying to go in the 1920s 
didn't necessarily work out that way for a lot of reasons, but there were a lot of exciting ideas in Russian fashion that were happening with people like Popova and Stepanova. Another exciting person who thought about fashion and how it could be a futurist material was this futurist Thayet. And he was a, an illustrator. He all the way on the end here, you can see his illustration he did for another designer um, who worked in Paris, Madeleine Viennet. And what I think that's interesting about him is that he kind of went in the other direction of some of these other people. He really wanted to strip fashion back. He wanted to make one single garment that would work for all people. So he created the tuta, which is basically a jumpsuit. It was also a play on words because it was meant to be like tuto, which in Italian meant everything. He also thought, I, if it's supposed to be for everyone, I have to make it accessible. So he also made patterns. He had one that was for women as well. He wasn't 100% sure the women should be wearing trousers, so he made one that had a skirt as well. But it was something that was his attempt to think, how should people in the future dress? And that was really his concern as an artist. And that was a concern of the Futurist Collective of Artists. They were thinking, what are we supposed, how do we prepare for the future? In many ways, how do we prepare for a future that is mechanized? How do we prepare for a future that's racing ahead? that's full of war possibly as well. They were right, at least on that front. But I think that it's, these are all examples of artists who are saying, how can I use my artistic thinking that doesn't really come from this place of trends, this place of change and use that in fashion. Sonia Delaunay was another artist who was very interesting as a designer because she did both at once. And she, her husband as well, it, Robert Delaunay was an artist and he painted somewhat similar works to hers. And what they believed in was simultaneity, which was this idea that everything should just be an experience and that that extended to fashion, that extended to everything that you encountered. And so she would make these textiles like this coat here. And she really thought that there was no difference between these different mediums, that if she was making a painting if she was making a jacket, these were all the same thing and she should be using the same strategies. And here you can see some more examples of that. This is a simultaneous dress that she made in 1913, one of her earliest, where you can see it's a kind of patchwork. And then all the way at the end, I love that picture in part because it's very difficult to see. And the reason it's very difficult to see is because the paintings in the background and the uh, fashion designs in front of it were made by the same person. So they all seem to be one big swoosh of color. I wish that they had it in color because I'm sure it would be magnificent. But even in black and white, you can see how it's really this overwhelming pattern that you're encountering. She did not stop at clothing and paintings. She also did cars. And this is a car that she also painted um, with her simultaneous, simultaneous design. She also liked to collaborate with other artists. This is a collaboration with Tristan Zara, who did the poetry that's on there. And this, so she would, he would do the poetry that was a kind of da-da poetry where it was found words and putting them together. This was something that really gelled with what she was interested in because she thought that the experiences should be very sudden, that they should have all these different colors attached to them. So she tried to translate his poetry into her fashion. Now, I'm right before we start this, this is going to be, this is the end. We are skipping way far ahead in time to 2001, but this is a moment that I think really crosses the line between fashion and art. When it comes to runway, how do we know whether what we're seeing is fashion or when it's becoming performance art. Is there a line and how do we know? So it's totally silent because the music was copyrighted. So <laughs> what you can see here is the his collection Voss from 2001. It was inspired by a mental hospital. It's actually padded the walls and ceilings. And he used a lot of found materials. So there are dresses with shells sewn all over them. There are dresses with um, laboratory slides sewn on them as well, feathers. 
So this is really a collection that puts together a lot of things that are absolutely unwearable. And you can also see that there's broken shells all over the runway that shows you just how unwearable it is. So once the runway goes black, there's also this moment where they're trying to figure out what is it that's gonna happen next. So this is a moment where they've kind of broken the rules of a runway. I mean, I don't see any models and she's not wearing any clothes. So we have a bit of an issue. The models come back, they pose, but there's really this idea that there's this moment that he's trying to give us that's somehow bigger than fashion or bigger than the runway show. It's not totally something he came up with, out of nothing, this is actually a pose that's based on a photograph that we can see in the next slide. And this is a photograph by Joel Peter Witkin called Senatorium that he did in 1983. And this is something that Joel Peter Witkin was really interested in, the idea of the macabre, the idea of disease and the grotesque. And that was something that McQueen was also playing with. And that was something that he was trying to bring into the runway as well. So I think that McQueen is a figure who it's really interesting to think about as someone who's kind of messing with us, trying to say, is this a fashion show? Is it not a fashion show? How far can I push the fashion show form until we say, stop, that's not a fashion show anymore? And I have one final video that is three minutes long, and it's about a recent collection from the duo Victor and Rolf, who are a Dutch fashion design duo who often make work that is trying to question, what is fashion? What is art? They also don't really sell any clothes. They really just do these runway performances and then sell their perfume. Um, some of you may have bought it. It's very popular, but it's really interesting the way they try and say, I think what we're doing is art. And I think we can see that pretty explicitly in this runway show. This is just a very fast cut together. I think for us the, the most emphasis is on the frames, so it's, okay. because the frames make the sculpture. Right. So if this is the wall, turning yeah. out wide, this will be the end result. Mm -hmm. So it's like okay. a composition. It's wearable art. It's incredible.
gave you something to think about when it comes to fashion and art. I'm not sure all of us could just take our clothes off and pin them on the wall and people call it art, but you know, that could be for later. Um, anyway, I'm so happy that you could join me tonight. I hope that if you have any questions, you'll be able to ask them now. I have my email address up there as well. If you later have a pressing question that's keeping you up in the middle of the night and you want to email me, go for it. I also have another slide after this one that has some books that I recommend. If this was a topic that you really loved and you want some recommended reading, I always like to end with a few books that I worked with for this presentation or that I think are really exciting. So if we have any questions, I'm all ears. Yes. Mm -hmm. The fabric was usually made in Lyon, but it was companies that were French because the French by that time had had a long history of being some of the finest workers with silks at that time. And those were all silks. So that that was something that they were doing in Lyon and that had been, and Lyon had been a center since the 18th century of that kind of really beautiful brocade. They do, they do. I mean, it's not the same. <laughs> I think that there isn't really necessarily the call for them that there was, but there certainly are some of the same companies now that there were, and they have some of the archives there from these companies that go back to the 18th century. Yes. Yes. I mean, I think that, I guess for me, I feel like if shock value takes the place of craft, it's not necessarily worth it. I think that when you, I think that doing something daring or unexpected, to be honest, at this point, I don't know that I can see that much that would surprise me. There, I see this, you know, in the 60s, Yves Saint Laurent was putting models with no tops on at all on the runway. Like there's not a lot that can really be innovated that's so shocking nowadays. And I think that if you're putting a lot of thought into it and you're putting a lot of craft into it, I think it's worth it to try new things. I think if you're saying, well, I'd rather just shock people than think too much about it, that's where it can go wrong. And that's not to say, I think for Victor and Rolf, for example, I don't love all of their collections. I think some are much more interesting and innovative than others. And some I think, hmm, I guess I'm glad I saw that. But I think that there's still something to be said by trying things. And I think that sometimes you don't know until you do it, whether it's gonna be good or not. <laughs> and so I think that it may be a little harsh to judge some of these things saying, well, the result wasn't what I hoped for. But I think that I do like to say, I am interested in people who are willing to push the boat out and to try something new, especially if they're willing to put the kind of time and effort and craft into it that Victor and Rolf do, for example, or Alexander McQueen. Thought I saw another hand, yes. My guess is no one. Um, I think that it depends on the couture on the couturier. I think that when it comes to Victor and Rolf, you might get a few red carpets, but they're not really making things that I think are wearable, not only because they're so expensive and elaborate, but I don't think they seem very comfortable even when the models are wearing them on the runway. And when I say comfortable, I mean, even for the standards of evening wear comfort, which I think are pretty low, like you should just be able to stand in it for a few hours and not want to rip all your clothes off. So I think that there's, for Victor and Rolf, I would say no one. I think that when it comes to these couturiers like Dior or like Chanel, there are people who are still buying couture. And I think the thing about couture is you can also adapt it to yourself. So a lot of times something you might see on the runway that's totally sheer when someone buys it, they probably will buy it lined. Or if you see something on the runway with no sleeves, if you're a couture customer and you'll pay $50,000 for your dress, probably more, I don't know why I said 50,000, $100,000 for your dress, they'll add some sleeves for you if you really want them. So I think that those things make them more wearable. I think that Victor and Rolf is more trying for, I guess shock value, but trying to gain interest, trying to think of what's interesting and new and to sell their perfume. Yes. Well, 
I think that that's an interesting question. I think that the two designers that did that were Moschino did one with marionettes and Dior did a collection that was basically on almost Barbie dolls, not quite Barbie doll um, proportions, but were very miniature ones that were made by the same people that work in their atelier that make the big ones. So they were very, very beautiful, but very, very small. Um, and I think that the it was interesting to see how different designers tried to innovate during the pandemic. I personally loved what Moschino did with their little marionettes because I thought that it was a moment when a little bit of levity was welcome. And I think that fashion shows felt maybe like not that important. This was in 2020. But at the same time, if they can entertain you and make you laugh at a time when not that much is that entertaining and not that much is making you laugh, I love a marionette wearing a zippy leather jacket. Yes. Some of them did, some of them did. Worth, I don't think did, but it was actually very common, as you say, um, from the 18th century to have what they called Pandoras, which were little dolls that were dressed in the latest fashions. And you would send them if you were a very wealthy woman to your friend who was a very wealthy woman somewhere else to show her what was most fashionable, primarily what was most fashionable in Paris. The designer I mentioned, the illustration was for, for Thayet, Madeleine Vianney, she was someone who really used these miniature um, mannequins as well because she liked to drape all of her clothes on these miniature mannequins because she could try out so many new ideas. So they have a long history, as you say. And I think that the different ways they've been used is really interesting. Yes. Well, I, one of my favorite designers is Madeleine Vianney, the one I was just talking about. I think that she's someone who doesn't really get that much attention now because a lot of her designs were pretty quiet in the way that they look. But from my perspective, the way they were cut and the way they used fabric was really revolutionary. So I am a big fan of Madeleine Vianney and she had a lot of really fascinating textiles that she worked with. I also really love Balenciaga. I thought that, I think that his way of using fabric and his very delicate hand and kind of sculptural approach to making fashion is amazing. And again, I think that the way he worked with materials was unmatched. I think actually Balenciaga is probably an example of someone who was able to innovate shapes while also thinking about his clientele and what they wanted to wear. And he was someone who was really attentive to what would make his clientele feel beautiful. And one thing he did, which I always think is really fascinating, is that he would drop the neckline on his jacket so that the collars in the back, they weren't straight, but they would kind of have a dip. And it really showed off the back of the neck. And it was a very flattering look. And that was something that you can't really do if you're making things off the rack because it's pretty custom to each person to see how far that should be away. And it was an idea he actually got from kimono because in kimono it's worn so that the neck, there's a kind of a space between the back of the kimono and the neck. So that was something that he did, which was interesting in the way it, he cut it, but also very much about making his clients feel attractive and stylish. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I, the funny thing is I have not, except for this room. So I did actually get a chance to look at this room and I did think, wow, this is such a perfect room and exhibition to have this talk because so many of these works are about how dress is part of identity and how important that is. And I think that these right here, the Martin Gutierrez are really interesting when you think about replication and models. She's really doing something interesting with mannequins. And I think that the question of how, especially in photography, you can do a lot with mannequins because they do look like people um, in a creepy way. So I think that the idea of what am I supposed to look like? How do I dress? How do I know how to be a woman is something that you get from things like mannequins, but is a problem because most of us don't look 
like mannequins. So there's this negotiation we have to make. And I think that that is especially true if there are things about the mannequins that are about identity, there are things about the mannequins that are about class. So I think that that's something that it's often mannequins are behind glass. There's this untouchability to them. So I've taken a little bit of time to look at these different works. And I definitely think that they're each engaging with a kind of fashion, perhaps not the fashion industry per se, but how clothing is part of identity, how it's part of heritage, and how it's part of being seen as a valuable person. I actually love the Toki Rome Taylor ones because I think that you can see how the care that she's putting in the accessorizing of these images and the layers of jewelry are meant to show how precious the people in it are. So I think that there's a lot that clothing can tell us about what the artist is trying to say. Unless there are any online questions that I haven't answered, I think that we're probably set unless there's anything burning that I need to answer now. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, I'm Marilyn Wright and I am the um, chairperson of the volunteer board. And I would just like to say as a textiles major um, and someone who took a lot of history of costume, your conversation with us today was extraordinary. It was like a continuing education class for me in particular, and probably for everyone else that's in our room. So thank you for coming to Charlottesville. Um, I know Matthew shared who um, our sponsors and um, partner businesses were, but I don't think you can thank people enough. So I just wanna um, give a one more shout out to say that we are grateful to our sponsors, the Annie Gould Gallery, Kaspari, uh, Jillian Valentine, the Lori Holiday Shop, Posh, Scarpa, and Tom and Rebecca LeCouillet. Now we have partner businesses too that I'd like to give a final shout out to. So in Charlottesville, Artsnick and Old Lace, Kaspari and Scarpa, and tomorrow, Friday, Please take some time and go downtown and to Barracks Road and um, visit our partner businesses. And Kaspari has a special event tomorrow night from five to seven. And then in Gordonsville, we have a lot of love in Gordonsville. So the Annie Gould Gallery, uh, Jillian Valentine, the Lori Holiday Shop and Posh. And on Saturday, take yourselves to Gordonsville because all of those businesses will be open as well. Um, with special events and displays for us. And lastly, I'd like to send some gratitude to ourselves, to the Freyland's Volunteer Board, because without you, and especially without Rebecca, this event would not be possible. This is our third year for fashion as art. And Rebecca has put this vision together. I also wanna give a shout out to Jane Grigg. She's not here, but she's responsible for that fabulous graphic with the year that changes and the interesting images beneath it. And then to all the volunteers who helped us tonight from the board, thank you very much. Uh, thank you to all of you who attended and to the people online, we are very grateful. Um, so we have a reception now for the people that are here, for the people that aren't here, please have a drink at home. and. Uh, Thank you for being part of the Freyland tonight.